You have no idea how long it took to to process and manually click all those points. So yeah, and you're excited by that, and she's just thinking you're weird. Yeah. <laughs> how awesome would it feel to know exactly? what a client or athlete needs to do to improve their performance. For instance, to know whether you should prescribe someone more pure strength development versus plyometric exercises in their program. Or to take that a step further, what if you could track and measure that information over time? To not only see what your athletes need now, but to critically evaluate your programming on the back end as well. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty freaking awesome to me. And that's why I've asked Dr. Paul Comfort to come on this week's episode of the Physical Prep Podcast. Dr. Comfort is a professor of strength and conditioning and program leader for the Master of Science Strength and Conditioning Program at the University of Salford. He is also an adjunct professor at Edith Cowan University in Western Australia. Paul has applied experience across a range of sports and consults with numerous professional and semi-professional sports teams which he has undertaken throughout his academic career. Last but not least, Paul is a founding member of the UK SCA, is on the NSCA Board of Directors, and is a Senior Associate Editor for the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research and Associate Editor for the European Journal of Sports Science and Sports Biomechanics. So needless to say, I think he knows a thing or two about the topics at hand today. Now, if you're a regular to the show, welcome back. As always, love and appreciate you. And if you're new here, welcome. I'm Mike Robertson, and this is the Physical Preparation Podcast. In this show, we take deep dives into the art and science of coaching, cueing, program design, business, and personal development. Basically, anything to help you become a better trainer, coach, or rehab professional. As someone that's just getting back into the world of sports science, I love learning about how today's technology can help us get better results for the clients and athletes we work with. In this episode, Paul and I start by talking about the benefits of isometric testing and why you might potentially choose it over your standard barbell tests. We talk about test selection and what you can garner from a standard isometric mid-thigh pull, an isometric squat, and why you might want to consider doing separate tests that are focused on rate of force development as well. In one of my favorite parts of the show, we talk about his non-negotiables when it comes to testing and why he's such a stickler for doing things the right way. And last but not least, we talk about the variables that are most impactful for Paul and what he chooses to spend the most time on when he's analyzing data. I realize this is our first episode of the year, but I think it's really, really good. Now, before we jump into this week's episode, I just want to give you a quick recap of the week that was, what's new in my neck of the woods, because it's probably been a couple of weeks since I did one of these. So, for starters, let's get all the the basic stuff out of the way. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Diwali, Kwanzaa, whatever holiday you celebrate at this time of year, I hope it was amazing. Second, I hope you had an amazing new year as well. I'll be honest, man, it has been a really long three-week period. I love my children more than anything, but I think all of us, myself, Jess, the kids, we are all looking forward to them going back to school and getting back into some semblance of normalcy because it's just been weird when you don't have any kind of rhythm or routine for three weeks. We're looking forward to getting back into that school routine. I mean, beyond just the three-week period, we had like a three or four-week, or sorry, a three or four-day period where that winter bomb cyclone thing came through Indiana and we were basically stuck indoors for three to four days. Every day I was like, oh, I'm going to get out or I'm going to walk the dog. And Jess is like, bro, it's like negative five. You don't want to go outside. So it has been a very chill period. Lots of hanging out. Even our New Year's Eve was pretty chill. Uh, We grilled out. I made myself a tasty old fashioned because that's something I'm trying to get into. I don't drink a lot, but every now and then it's nice to have a tasty beverage. So had an old-fashioned, uh, made a great steak, and we played some games as a family. Mostly downloaded some new tracks of Mario Kart, which hits the exact same now as it did when I was a young kid. So still love some Mario Kart. Now my kids love it, so it's a lot of fun doing that. But yes, we're starting to get back into routine this week. My kids go back to school towards the end of the week. 
But man, you know, I had a couple assessments at the gym, which has been fun. We're going to talk about force plates in this episode, just really diving into that, learning more about my athletes, learning more about how they move and how we can prescribe better activities for them. That's been super fun. A lot of content creation uh, beyond just the podcast, trying to drop videos every week. I'm trying to write some form of written long form content every week. So lots of new content. If you're not already a subscriber to the newsletter, go there right now, robertsontrainingsystems.com. Put your name and email in so you know when we're dropping content every week because I feel like there's something valuable I'm putting out every single week. So, you know, assessments, content creation, lots going on. Excited to get back into a routine. But like I said up top, I hope you had an amazing holiday season. I hope your New Year's was safe, fun, and man, let's make 2023 an amazing year. So we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to jump into this awesome first episode of the year with Dr. Paul Comfort. Today's episode of the Physical Preparation Podcast is brought to you by Hawken Dynamics. Hawken Dynamics consider themselves part of the process, not the process. Force plates are in no way, shape, or form new technology, but Hawken has brought them to the 21st century. Hawken Dynamics plates are wireless, which makes them portable and easy to set up and use. You'll have the ability to performance test your athletes in a matter of seconds and give them immediate feedback on their strengths and weaknesses. And last but not least, their software interface is clean, intuitive, and easy on the eye, so both you and your athletes can visualize what's going on and how to improve their performance. Now, the reason I invested in Hawken Dynamics Force Plates was simple. I was tired of feelings and subjective information being the sole driver of my decision-making process. At this point in my career, I want a blend of both subjective assessments and objective-driven metrics to drive my program design. I love the idea of having dual force plates so you can see side-to-side differences and asymmetries, especially in athletes who are in the return-to-play process. I want to be able to collect and track data across the athletic spectrum, from our young kiddos to my elite athletes that are playing in the NBA or MLS. Another driver for me was finding ways to assess performance that aren't reliant on lifting technique. While I would never bring a kid in and test their 1RM squat or deadlift on day one, I have zero issue putting them on force plates to test their power in a vertical jump or their force output in a mid-thigh pull or iso squat. But arguably the biggest driver for me was being able to take all of this technology and making it incredibly easy to use. With options to lease or buy, coupled with a five-year warranty, I'm confident that Hawken Dynamics Force Plates can take your performance facility to the next level. To learn more, head over to hawkendynamics.com or follow them on Instagram at Hawken Dynamics. Or for direct sales inquiries, feel free to reach out to Drake Berberet directly at drake at hawkendynamics.com or follow him on Instagram at strength2.speed. Paul, man, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Really excited to have you on. Big fan of your work. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm uh, recently appointed as a full professor at the University of Salford. Um, The first full professor in sports science there, which is a real privilege and honor. I've been there now almost 15 years. It'll be 15 years on the 4th of January. Wow. Um, So, you know, it's uh, it's been a good place to, to work. And I've, I've definitely learned and developed over time, working with numerous different um, colleagues, some that are still there, some that some that used to be there. So I originally got appointed by uh, Dr. Phil Graham Smith 15 years ago. Uh, he's moved on to Aspire now, absolutely loves false plates. Um, and yeah, it's, it's it's been a great experience because we've got such a wealth of different sports teams in the local area, primarily Premier League soccer teams and other levels of competition right through the championship down. Um, rugby league teams, uh, a couple of rugby union teams, but rugby union is not, not that big in the north of England. Um, <clears throat> and it's been a great opportunity for me to not only do the research, but also to continue doing stuff in applied environments, primarily on a sort of advisory or consultancy basis. Um, so yeah, that's where I've been for the last 15 years. Before that, I was at uh, Middlesex University uh, for five years and then moved around for a few years before that in sort of one or two year contracts at different universities, whilst luckily for me, also trying to work with athletes, whether it's athletes on scholarship programs at universities, 
um, or advising and consulting with um, sports teams in the local area, which tends to happen quite a lot in the UK. Um, so it's been really nice to be able to actually do the research plus still be involved in sport at whatever level, you know, whether, whether that's amateur right the way through to the elite level. I love it. I love it. And what originally got you into physical preparation? How did you get started in this whole world? Well, I started way before strength and conditioning was strength and conditioning in the UK. Yeah. So there was no UK strength and conditioning association. Actually, somebody bought me the essentials of strength training and condition. I think it was must have been the second edition for my 21st birthday. Um, prior to that, I'd got probably the same as what got a lot of people into strength and conditioning and physical performance was Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. Yeah. This, this, the thing is huge. <laughs> yes. I read through that, started reading through loads of other literature. It was far more bodybuilding based at that point. That's all you could get, get access to. Yep. Um, and yeah, really just I started off uh, qualifying as a personal trainer, aged 18, um, not knowing what I really wanted to do, starting personal training and working in, in a gym, primarily working with either overweight um middle-aged men that had a lot of money and would pay for it yeah. or athletes that wanted to get fitter, faster, stronger. But as I said, there was no strength and conditioning at that point. They just wanted somebody to help them get fitter, stronger, what, you know, whatever their goal was. Um, so it was those two sort of diverse um, populations that I ended up working with, which was, uh, which was fantastic. And then after a couple of years of doing that, I thought maybe I should go to university and do, and do a degree and actually learn about this. But even <laughs> back then it was, it was, you could do sport related degrees. Most of them weren't just sports science. They either had leisure management or it was physical education or something else linked to it. And I didn't want to know about running a gym. I ended up sort of doing a bit of that for a while. Um, I didn't want to become a PE teacher. I didn't want to work with, you know, 12 to 18 year olds. Yeah. You know, no chance. <laughs> I, <was not. laughs> um, I wanted to work with, with athletes and people that wanted to train for whatever purpose. Um, so, yeah, it was really, you know, reading things like the Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding, look at the NSEA text when I was 21. I think I was one year into my degree at that point and saying, wow, this is fantastic. I need to I need to keep doing more of this. Um, and that, that was what really got me started. I love it. I love it. So you already told us a little bit kind of about your your career path and the stops along the way. One thing I didn't think to ask, which I think is relevant to today's topic is when did you first get exposed to force plates and when did you start using those and trying to you know figure out what you could and couldn't do with those i suppose that was probably while i was at middlesex university so about 20 years ago something like okay. that um, but that was just a little bit of playing around a bit of tinkering you know there was no bespoke software which did stuff for you it was that had to be done copy paste the the data file out, put it in excel see if you oh, can yeah. calculate the right variables make a hell of a lot of mistakes <laughs> uh, but the, the the good thing is though you learn from those mistakes i suppose really it was when i got to um salford university 15 years ago um and we would go out testing regularly as i mentioned uh, dr phil graham smith uh, employed me he used to do a lot of stuff with um uk and british athletics we used to go around a lot of the different football clubs at that point before football clubs had force plates yeah. and conduct a whole host of pre-season testing, sometimes in season. We used to do the same with uh, Sale Sharks Rugby Union Club, which is the primary rugby union club in this area. And the, uh, the university had a, a partnership with uh, Salford Red Devils Rugby League Club. So we did a lot of work with them. And I was lucky that I was given a day a week to sort of facilitate those partnerships with the rugby league and the rugby union team. So that was when we really got stuck into doing some of this testing. But again, at that point, it was really a case of you collect all the data, you then go away and I would come home and sit at the desk that I'm at now and probably spend the next six hours sort of copying and pasting a whole column of data into a spreadsheet, analyzing that, writing up individualized reports for each player. And if you were lucky, three or four days later, you'd get the report back to the team <laughs> because you've got 30 athletes you've tested. You've done, you know, three to five counter movement jumps, three to five rebound jumps of whatever description they might be. Um, you've done the same with an isometric squat or an isometric mid thigh pull. So all of those trials, the amount of data you're copying and pasting and then analyzing and then looking and say, oh, there's an anomaly there. What went wrong? Oh, we didn't get them st to stand still for a second. Right, we need to discount <laughs> that trial. Now we need to do. And, you know, so it was it was a great experience because we still get our students to do that now. 
Yeah. We give them the Kistler force plates where it's copy and paste. Yeah. All force time data make loads of mistakes because suddenly you realize why you have to be obsessive over how you perform the test to make sure that you can analyze the data appropriately and you don't end up with huge var variation in the variables because you did the testing wrong or not necessarily wrong, but differently. Yes. Um, so, you know, it was nice to, I say nice at the time, I never thought it was nice spending hours and hours copying, <laughs> pasting, you know, Excel data, but um, yeah, it's probably 15 years ago. And then must be about the last four or five years where we've had what we got now. I think we've currently got five sets of Hawking Dynamics force plates and we're about to order another five sets. Oh wow. Um, for a range <laughs> of different projects. So we, we take them out and we go we go off site and do testing with lots of different clubs around uh, around the sort of well within about a two hour drive from us. Um, and that's when it's probably taken off the most purely because it's so easy to collect multiple sets of data. We only used to have two sets of Kistler plates um, and it would take hours, as I've just described, to analyze yeah. the data that is now. Somebody jumps, pulls, pushes if it's a squat, um, and the, the data's there. So yeah. now it's so much quicker. And I've done it numerous times recently where I've gone off-site maybe a, a two-hour driveway. We've tested a couple of squads of athletes. Before I've even got home, John McMahon, one of my colleagues, is sat at home downloading stuff from the cloud, generating the reports, and the reports are sent normally <laughs> with him doing a five-minute summary on, on a video um, with the squad averages, etc. That's already sent and, and at the club before I get home. Yeah. Which is fantastic because I used to get home and spend hours analyzing it. Now I'm getting <laughs> home with a five minute video and going, I'm done. I can, you know, I can go and get a bit. Yeah. Oh, man. It, I don't want to get on a tangent, but you're just reminding me of all of my master's days, right? The days where I'm stuck in a room just cropping MRIs and like cross sectional areas of quads. I remember doing the uh, stick figures you know, on an approach jump for volleyball, having to like manually click all of these things, pulling the frame data from frame. the force plates. Oh my gosh. Yes. Like literally. And I would show my then girlfriend, now wife, she's like, what did you do all week? And I'm like, look, and it's like a stick figure animation of somebody doing a jump. And she's like, that's it. And I'm like, you have no idea how long it took. To, to process and manually click all those points so yeah and you're excited by that and she's just thinking you're weird <laughs> yeah well she probably already thought I was weird but man okay this is great so what I want to start with is talking about testing assessments evaluations because like you alluded to you're in the research side but you interact with coaches on a daily basis and most coaches like myself we grew up doing RM testing right? Whether it's a trap bar, a squat to evaluate force production. And again, because that's how we learn and that's how we came up. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on the role and the value of isometric testing. What are some of the benefits of going that route versus our standard barbell test? Well, I think first of all, the standard barbell test, it's reliable measurement error normally, even in, you know, I did a study with John McMahon, I've already mentioned, where we looked at 1RM um, performances in the squat and the power clean um, in males and females, recreationally trained, less than six months training experience, uh, but competent in the lifts. Sure. Because um, unlike some coaches say, you know, where it's, oh, it takes far too long to coach the weightlifting exercises. Yeah, that's only if you're not a very good coach. <laughs> um, that may be controversial, but it's true. You can teach, yeah. you can teach basic competence in a short period of time. And then within six months of training, you can definitely get any individual, um, as long as they're not injured, trying to one RM. So we looked at test, retest reliability, and you were looking at less than a 5% uh, measurement error between testing sessions. Wow. So it, it's reliable. That's great. Yeah. And we need some one, some one RMs for programming, because we normally program based off um, you know, your percentage of your 1RM. And I know a lot of people use velocity-based training for it, but the measurement area with most velocity-based devices is greater than 10%. Mm -hmm. So I'd personally stick with a 1RM because yeah. it's far more reliable. Um, <clears throat> now, there are times in competition, etc., when you may not, in season, when you may not want to do the 1RMs, then you've got to be very, very precise with that velocity-based device if you were using that. But the 1RMs are great. However, what they don't tell you, and this is the, the issue sometimes with the velocity-based side of things, you can have somebody doing a 1RM squat and they're at 0 
meters per second for their mean velocity. You can bring them back in three or four days later, they're 0 0.25. Next time they're 0 0.35 and then they fail the next load. So good athletes grind it out. And you all have seen this, you know, how many times have you seen an athlete where you're thinking, oh, they're not going to manage this. They've stopped. But they're just moving so slowly. It's almost imperceptible, and they grind through it. Yeah. Good athletes do that. Um, so there's a lot of variability there. There seems to be less variability um, with with one RMs. And I know that Greg Half and one of his um, doctoral students down at Edith Cowan University have been doing this. I think they've done it with one RM, three RM, six RM. Uh, some of the results are quite interesting. I'm not going to give them away because I've been privileged to have those discussions, but they haven't published it yet. So we'll yeah. wait until they get published. <laughs> um, so, so that testing is is beneficial and it is required, but it's also really easy just to embed it in a training session. You know, you do your first lift, you do a couple of, of, of sets of three repetitions, almost like a warm up, and then you can go in for a max lift, or you can predict one RM from a three RM. Uh, but what it doesn't tell you is how how efficiently and how effectively you you produce that force. So it doesn't tell you about your force at 100, 200, 300 milliseconds. Um, or rate of force development. Now, rate of force development can be reliable with um, isometric testing. Um, I wouldn't use it with dynamic testing. It tends to be hugely variable. Mm. Um, but at the same time, it depends on the method you use to calculate rate of force development. You can calculate you know, force divided by time, but there's a loads of nuances to that. Do you look at it over a certain time frame? Do you have a moving average window where you actually look at a 20 millisecond period within a 200 milliseconds, et cetera. And everyone does it differently. So the isometric testing is really good because a bit like maximum strength testing with the 1RM, it's not really sensitive to fatigue. So you can really beat somebody up and they can still get a peak force, which is comparable to what they did when they were fresh. Mm. Same as with the 1RM, the velocity will decrease, but actually they can still grind out that 1RM, which is, which is brilliant. Now, what it does also tell you, though, is that ability to produce force rapidly. So your force at different time points, normally 150, 200, 250 milliseconds. And that gives us a good indication of, well, if the athlete's really strong, but they can only produce, let's say, 50%, and I'm just making up these numbers at the moment, yeah. but 50% of their um, peak isometric force within 250 milliseconds, they're probably not very good at expressing force rapidly. So I need to work on the more ballistic, dynamic, plyometric force production. But if they're producing 85% of their peak isometric force in 250 milliseconds, they're really, really efficient at producing force rapidly. So that athlete just needs to get stronger. We don't get that from a 1RM. We can't get that information. But also, we cannot predict a 1RM from isometric tests. You know, while in, in some cases there's a couple of studies that have a correlation of 0.9 um, between weightlifting exercises and isometric mid-thigh pull in weightlifters, that's fantastic. That works for weightlifters, and they're really, really good at being very consistent with those performances. But that only, still only explains 81% of the shared variance between the 1RM and the isometric mid-thigh pull peak force. Most other situations are at about a 0 0.6, 0 0.7. Mm. And if it's 0 0.6, then that's explaining 36% uh, of the shared variance. That's not good enough to try and predict from. Right. We can't do that. So there are situations where we need 1RM testing and isometric strength testing um, to give us the full picture. But at the same time, we've got to be realistic on, well, have we got time to do all of that? Right. I love it. I love it. Okay. So talking about the isometric mid thigh pull or the IMTP, it's arguably the most common isometric test we have out there. So if someone's listening to this and they want to start integrating that into their testing battery, I'd love to hear from you, somebody that's probably done thousands or tens of thousands of these over his career. What are some of the biggest setup and performance issues you've seen and how can we work to address them and get more reliable data? Yeah, the two biggest things are posture and not using lifting straps. Hmm. Okay. So you must use lifting straps, otherwise you're not testing lower body force production, you're assessing grip strength. So you have to use lifting straps. And I've heard people made a load of excuses. It takes too long. I've got X number of athletes to go through. Have two sets of lifting straps, and while you're testing one person, have the other person put the straps on. Uh, 
with most false plates, you can stay stood on the false plates for the three trials that you perform. Worst case scenario, you stay strapped to the bar, you step off the false plates, and then they step back on. But you can stay strapped to the bar. It probably adds 20 seconds to testing one person by using lifting straps, but it gives you reliable and consistent data. Even if you try using an opposing grip, there's still a limitation. I've got pilot data, and it is only pilot data. I think we've got 12 subjects where we tried a standard overhand grip, a hook grip. It's horrible. <laughs> it, it's agony on the thumbs. So yeah. within about a second, you relax. An opposing <laughs> grip, that's better, but you still lose your grip. You, it's still not uh, anywhere near as good um, as using straps. Uh, the straps appear at the moment from 12 subjects, and I, I need to go and collect more, but... From 12 subjects, the straps give you at least a 10% higher force production. Oh, wow. And in terms of rapid force production, it's much greater than that because you don't feel like you need to build up that force progressively in case your grip goes. You can just go for it. Um, I've only had one incident of somebody losing their grip using straps in, as you've just described, tens of thousands of tests. Wow. And that was a strap that was a little bit worn and it, it ripped. Mm. Um, so no one loses their grip when they're using straps. If it's a smooth bar that you're using, some of the bars we've got are knurled, some of them are smooth, use chalk as well. We've experienced recently, uh, we went out and did some testing and all the equipment had been in my car, well, the force plates weren't, but all of the isometric mid-thigh pull rigs had been in my car overnight. It dropped to minus five. We got to the testing venue, took the bars in, they suddenly end up covered in condensation. So get the bars there early, warm them up, <laughs> get chalk on the bars, dry them out, because otherwise, again, that can be a problem. Um, but the big, so the two biggest things, grip strength, you have to use straps, and posture. People butcher the posture. The posture is the start of the second pull phase of a clean. Now, it's called a mid-thigh pull. If you've got a long torso in short arms, that's closer to the crease of the hip. That's not mid-thigh. Okay. If you've got long arms and a short torso, that's lower than mid-thigh for some people. Most people, it does end up roughly mid-thigh. If you think of mid-thigh being the top of the patella to the iliac crest, not to the inguinal crease. So <clears throat> adopt that second poor posture. It's really easy. It's like you're sitting on the edge of a bar stool or get the athlete to stand upright because you probably don't want to encourage the athlete to be sat on a bar stool. <laughs> tell them to stand upright. Go to maximum dorsiflexion. And unless they're a weightlifter, max dorsiflexion is fine. Uh, we're lucky with the rigs that we've got, the portable rigs, because the uprights on them, you make sure their shoulders are behind the uprights and just slightly behind the line of the bar, the same as it would be for the start of a second pull. And the only other thing you have to do then, for some people, they go a little bit lordotic. They start sticking, sticking their butt out a little bit. So in that situation, cue them to make sure they've braced everything, they're tensed up. Um, and they're not sticking the bum out. If you get that right, it's it can be really, really reliable. Um, the only thing we see on very strong athletes is we sometimes have to set it slightly below that because you can get some flexion within the system. Not the bar. We use cold rolled steel bars. They do not flex. Weightlifting bars will flex. Um, but the base of the platform, if somebody's generating over 6,000 newtons, that starts to flex a little bit. Mm. So it's only with the strongest athletes. Um, that will negatively affect our rate of force development, um, possibly peak force. Um, but if we're longitudinally monitoring those athletes, there's not many that get over 6,000 newtons, I'll be honest with you. Um, but if we're longitudinally monitoring them, it's the same effect. It's the same system, the same setup. So for monitoring, if they've got better or worse, it's the same. Um, Obviously, we can't really use that then for research purposes because we don't know how much effect that's having. But at least for those athletes and feeding back to the coaching staff, we can give them that information. There's a series of studies. There's a couple by Stuart Guppy. There's a couple by Dr. George Beckham. Um, Stuart Guppy is one of uh, Professor Half's PhD students that clearly show a notable difference in force time characteristics if you change your posture. So you have to get that posture correct. And it's a really easy posture to hit. I think some people get it wrong. I've seen every single force plate manufacturer with incorrect images of the performance of an isometric mid-thigh pull. Yeah. 
So that makes it worse. <laughs> and I'll be honest, at conferences, I'll I comment on that. I'll, I, when I've presented on the isometric mid-flight bullet conferences, I'll put up an image from every single force plate manufacturer to go, look, I'm not biased here. They've all done it wrong in some of these photos. At the same time, we've we've had people come into our university and try and take marketing shots, and they'll do that. And I'm like, you can't use that image. That's wrong. The <laughs> students just got that completely wrong while they were doing it. So I'm not saying it's them individually that's the problem. Sure. Somebody took the photo, put it on social media or whatever, and it was wrong. But it does make a massive difference. Um, it doesn't affect the reliability. So if you use the same posture every time, but it's incorrect, it still comes out reliable. But the problem is, if you get to that correct posture, your forces are much higher. Mm. And your rate of force development or force early time points is much higher. So we need to put the athlete in the posture, which gives them, the biomechanically, the best position for them to be in. And as I said, it's really easy. Stand them up, go to max dorsiflexion, make sure the shoulders are just slightly behind the bar and that everything's braced. They're not on an excessive lordosis. And you go from there. It's pretty simple, but... Yeah, people keep getting it wrong, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I'm going to link to uh, this article that you wrote way yep. back in the day. Standardization and methodological considerations for the isometric mid-thigh pull. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Hopefully they can download that. Uh, fantastic article. Unfortunately, because of that article, I have killed a lot of trees. Uh, not just because of that article, but it's one of those where you go back and you find the references and you're in the references and you're like, oh, that sounds good. That sounds good. So that led to about 20 other articles that I'm now reading. But I will say this. The comment about dorsiflexion makes all the difference in the world. Because uh, I was reading this. I had listened to some of your other work before I started doing this. And I had a couple athletes just weren't getting it. I gave them that cue and immediately they were in the right posture. So if you're yeah. trying to do this, the max dorsiflexion cue with the shoulders either in line or slightly behind made all the difference and it was very repeatable, very consistent. So love it. Okay. Give me a second to monologue here as I set this question up. So as we talked about before the show, as listeners of the show probably already know, I have my degree in this. It's from like 20 years ago. Force plates were not affordable. They weren't something that you had in a gym back then. But one of the things that I've been trying to do is create a battery of tests that is sufficient, but also not redundant. So it kind of leads me to this idea of isometric mid-thigh pulls for just max force production versus rate of force production. We, you and I both know both values are important and they both give us clues as to what kind of athlete we're dealing with and what they need to do in their training. So the question is, do you think it's necessary to perform both the standard isometric mid-thigh pull where you're pulling for three to five seconds and a separate RFD test? Or do you think it's sufficient to just do the max IMTP test and then pull the RFD data from that? So sorry for the long-winded question. Hopefully you understand where I'm going with that. Yep. Yeah, no, I completely understand where you're going. Uh, I've, got to, I've got to start off by saying it depends and apologize. Yeah. <laughs> I know that answer. Yes. If you're working with athletes that are very, very, very familiar with the test, you can possibly get away with just doing the traditional approach okay. because you end up with reliable, rapid force production. Um, they don't ramp it up over time. They hit peak force in under a second. Um, and you may be able to get away with that in that situation. Um, for the more explosive ballistic type effort, and I know nothing explodes um, and it's not ballistic because it's isometric, but um, for when you cue them to go, you know, as fast as you can for one second, the reliability of that data is so much better. But peak force comes down. Right. So if we want peak force and we want rapid force production to be as reliable as possible and as true a representation of their maximum force and their rapid force production we probably do need the two however that doesn't add much more time because if i do three maximal effort isometric mid thigh pull trials lasting five seconds and if you've got a live force trace on the screen you can stop after a few seconds because you can see they've peaked and it starts dropping yep. you might as well terminate the test let them relax the one second explosive efforts with a 30 second rest in between that's an extra minute yeah so it takes doesn't take much time at all. 
if you are getting very, very consistent and reliable rapid force production or rate of force development with athletes, you can probably get away with that one test and save a little bit of time. You know, because if you've got 30 athletes, it might only be a minute per person. That's 30 minutes. Sure. That's a lot of time. Yep. But if it's not reliable rate of force development or force it 150, 200, 250 milliseconds, when you do the traditional approach, then you're going to have to do the that more explosive approach as well. The interesting thing with it is if we start looking like um, Agard and Anderson and stuff, people have done with um, single joint isometrics, normally knee extension, we can then actually express your force at a certain time point, let's say 250 milliseconds as a percentage of your peak force. And as I mentioned earlier, if we can produce a high percentage, 90% of your peak isometric force in 250 milliseconds, that tells me a lot. Yeah, that tells me that athlete is really reactive, really responsive. They can produce force very efficiently. Then I look at the isometric peak force, and I'm probably thinking mm, that's not very good. So we need to focus on peak force. We need to get them stronger. Yeah. If we flip that around, if they can only produce forty or fifty percent of their isometric peak force in two hundred and fifty milliseconds, that immediately tells me I need to get them doing stuff where they're far more reactive. But only if I know that they are really putting in a maximal intent in aiming for rapid force production. And as I said earlier, weightlifters, fantastic at doing that. Yep. Because that's what they do as part of their sport. They hit that mid-thigh pull position every time they perform a clean or a snatch or any variation of them. Other athletes, not so much. So we also need to look at not just the training status of the athlete, how strong they are, how familiar, familiar they are with these tasks. So it, it, it really is a, it depends we can also get that information, though, from looking at things like dynamic strength index. Yep. So if you've got an athlete who's dynamic strength index, so the ratio of their isometric, um, sorry, their counter movement jump peak force during the propulsive phase compared to their isometric mid-thigh pull peak force, that the way it's most commonly done, if you're up at 0.8 or higher, that tells us that you're producing at least 80% of your isometric peak force during a dynamic task. So you're pretty efficient at expressing force rapidly in that uh, in a dynamic, stre slow stretch, short in cycle task. If you're down below 0.6, so let's say 0.55, that means you're expressing 55% of your isometric mid thigh pull peak force during a counter movement jump. So you're not very good at using your maximum force generating capacity when you jump. So we know you need to work more on the on that sort of explosive ballistic plyometric type of task. Now, at the same time, it's only a ratio. So if you look at that and go, well, okay, they're expressing X amount, but you look and go, well, the athlete's isometric mid thigh pull peak force is 20 newtons per kilogram. They're as weak as a child, so they just <laughs> need to get strong. <laughs> as weak as an untrained child, should yeah. I? I should. <laughs> Um, if they're up in the, you know, 40 or 50 newtons per kilogram, and that's their net force, so you've subtracted, subtracted body weight from it, then they're in a good position. They're okay. 40 or 50 newtons per, per kilogram, they're doing well. Um, so you do need to think anytime there's any form of ratio that you're looking at, or even that percentage, you know, the percentage of your peak force that you can produce in 250 milliseconds, if you can produce um, only 55%, of your isometric mid thigh pull peak force in 250 milliseconds, but you're really weak. Just get stronger. Yeah. Really simple. Just work on maximum force production. Yeah. Don't do anything fancy. Get them stronger. Uh, so you always have to come back to that. But at the same time, you can flip it. If you're getting, you know, 65 newtons per kilogram, you're probably going to have to spend a lot of time and effort to get them much stronger. Right. You know, like, a bit like, you know, the, the, the values that are thrown around for a squat. If you're doing a, a, a two, 2.5 body weight squat, you're probably better off spending more time, not only, but more time on your ballistic and plyometric capability than you are on focusing on maximum force production because you're really strong. You're going to progress slowly in that area. So you can, you know, you, you can pretty much put a solid bet on. Um, that they'll get more out of that more ballistic and plyometric training, but they still need to maintain that maximum force production capability. I love it. Okay, so kind of along those same lines, it was a different podcast or lecture that you had out there. I mean, honestly, they're like all blending together as I'm trying to assimilate all of this. 
But you had mentioned, obviously, you enjoy like pulling this RFD data out. And we talked about 50 milliseconds, 100, 150, 250. But especially on the low end, like 50, 100 milliseconds, it's not always reliable as you'd like. So with that being said, maybe for starters, when are you chasing those really fast numbers, right? 50 to 100. Uh, does it depend on the athlete you're working with, the quality of the force plates? I just love to hear a little bit more insight to that because that really kind of piqued my interest. Yeah, I, th I think in terms of the force plates themselves, the quality of the force plates, I think the majority now sample at a thousand hertz plus. Um, as long as you look at the force plate and it doesn't flex when you push down on it, um, then you're okay. It's got to be solid enough for that. That's fine. Um, we do need to consider the isometric mid thigh pull setup that you have to make sure that there's no give within that system. As I said earlier, the ones we've got, you hit 6,000 newtons, which is pretty impressive. Yeah. And it starts to flex a little bit. Most systems don't. If we're doing it um, in our lab, um, there's no flexion occurring anywhere. The, the system's so rigid that it doesn't flex. However, for a portable one, we probably couldn't pick the base plate of the rig up if it was able to withstand the 6,000 newtons of force. So there's, there's some that comes from that system, but I don't think, to be honest with you, that you know, the force plates themselves make much of a difference because everyone seems to be having force plate sample at a thousand hertz are pretty solid and robust in terms of the hardware. Yeah. Um, some of it definitely comes from how you analyze the data. How do you identify the onset of the pull? What thresholds are used, etc. And that does make a bit of a difference. Um, and then you've also got the athlete themselves. If they're familiar with it, they're really good at producing force rapidly, but you can see those that ramp it up and build up progressively. You can see it from just looking at the force time curve. Yeah. So in those situations, that can be problematic. Most of the time, you know, I've published a couple of papers where we've used 50, 100 milliseconds in there. To be honest, we don't report that back to the athletes um, because think about most actions in the majority of sports and you're looking at 150 to 250 milliseconds. If, you, if you're looking at top speed running and elite sprinters, you're getting down to that 100 millisecond mark. But I'm not look, working with elite sprinters. It's people that are on 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 different football, rugby pitches, etc. Um, especially in the north of England, with the rain and soft ground, it's over 100. It's 150 milliseconds plus. Yeah. Um, if they get top speed. Yeah. Um, so you know, normally reporting back to the athletes is the 150 to 250. Now, interestingly, that also means there's a stronger correlation. As that as that time period increases, it becomes more and more reliable and it becomes more closely related to maximum force production as well. Mm. So, yeah, normally 150, 200, 250 milliseconds are the time points we go with, especially if we're feeding back to athletes and, and to coaches. Um, and the key thing is cueing them and making sure they do push as hard and fast as possible. Yeah. And if you can see them ramping up, we just discard the trial, explain why, show them the force time curve that it's not going up rapidly. It's, you know, it's it's a slow curve. Yes. You, you know, it's like somebody's just sketching something rather than, you know, having a shock and putting a line vertically. Um, point that out to them. Sometimes give them a quick demonstration and then let them go again. Uh, what we try and do is make sure there's always groups of athletes being tested together. Because then we can project up onto a screen or onto a TV or laptop the, the um, force force time curve and show them what it should look like and explain the difference between them. And especially when you do the warm up trials, yeah. so you normally do a warm up at fifty percent, one at seventy five, one at ninety, mm -hmm. and then go max effort. And you see that curve becoming more and more vertical. And then you highlight that to them. And as soon as you do that, it's great because straight away their teammates will ridicule them. <laughs> probably will be bullying in some circumstances but you know, they'll get a little bit of verbal abuse if they're not getting that almost vertical line and that is surprising how much that helps uh, by making sure that there is that competitiveness with any type of testing um, and yeah you you know there, there always has to be it's always referred to in the literature as strong verbal encouragement yes you shout at them as, as loud as you can and you get the teammates, and if the coach is there, even better, get the head coach to shout at them as well. You get really <laughs> well, that brings me to another point, coming back to our kind of ideas on getting good tests. The strong verbal encouragement, but also just talking about pushing. 
right? And I know that's something that you've talked about, the, the idea of pushing versus pulling. And I found I've had to reinforce that idea as well, because a lot of times it's called an isometric mid-thigh pull, right? Yeah. So they assume they're supposed to pull. And then all of a sudden, like you said, they're bending their elbows or they're basically trying to cheat the test versus trying to push through the plates. Yeah, and I think that's partly because you think about when, you know, this test was first established uh, by Professor Mike Stone, him and uh, Professor Greg Haff first published on it in 1997. They've been using that for a few years beforehand with weightlifters. Yep. If you tell a weightlifter to pull, they drive their feet into the floor because they're used to performing pulling variations, whether it's a snatch pull, a clean pull, whether it's from mid-thigh, however they've done it, they're used to pulling. Yep. But when you tell a weightlifter to pull, it's drive the feet into the floor as hard and fast as possible. Right. That's not the same for everyone else. Right. So that, that's where that issue comes from. Um, but yeah, you, you do have to tell them to push. In fact, one of my colleagues did some testing with some athletes uh, about a week ago. And one of the athletes was actually turned around and said, why are you telling them to push and not pull? Isn't it an isometric mid five pull? So he had to explain. And he actually cued the athlete to pull. And then he cued them to push during their warm-up trials and they got much greater results with telling them to push. It also means when you tell them to push their feet into the ground hard and fast, you don't get an excessive uh, sort of lordosis occurring in them arching backwards. Yes. Almost trying to do like you see a powerlifter do on the top of the lockout of a deadlift. Yep. That makes sense for a powerlifter. The coach, uh, sorry, the referee has to go, they finish the lift. So exaggerate it. That's not what we do when we do an isometric mid thigh pull. That's not what you should do with a deadlift in training. There's right. a reason powerlifters do that. But you can avoid some of that by cueing them to brace and then to push rather than pull. Yeah, love it. Okay, so a couple months back, I had our guy Drake from Hawk and Dynamics on here, and I put a kind of put him through uh, the paces. But I said, if you only get three tests to perform and you're screening your athletes, what are you going to pick? And he said he would use a counter movement jump a rebound jump, and an ISO squat versus an IMTP. So for someone who is just building out their assessment profile, trying to pick certain tests, what would you say are the biggest differences between the IMTP and the ISO squat? That's hugely variable because you see a lot of people, especially if they're not muscular. So if you see it with soccer players in the UK, um, we don't like a barbell on the back. It compresses. It hurts. They right. just not got training history. Um, they'll use one of the pads that goes on it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, brilliant. So that compresses, and your joint angle changes by about ten degrees. Right. They don't bother doing that. They'll also complain if they've got wrist straps on because it creates a bit of chafing on the wrist. Deal with it. It's uh, you know a few seconds. You'll be okay. <laughs> um, so, but it is hugely variable in terms of some people find it more comfortable doing the isometric squat. So if you've, if you've got joint angles standardized between the ISO squat and ISO pull, you will normally get higher forces and higher rates of force development with the isometric squat. However, a lot of people are worried about the axial loading through the spine um, and the compressive forces. That still happens with an isometric mid thigh pull. You just don't perceive it in the same way because right. there isn't a bar of your trapezius. You cannot use a pad. Because your joint angles will change, the peak force decreases, rate of force development decreases, so you cannot do that. Um, but actually, and again, this is only pilot data, and we're, we're trying to collect some more of this data at the moment. It's hugely variable, depending on the person's preference. Okay. If somebody is happy, comfortable, and familiar with the isometric mid-thigh pull, they can score better on the ISO pull. Hmm. But... If they're more comfortable with the isometric squat, they can brace their trunk. They don't feel any compression through the spine. They perform much, much better on, on the isometric squat. So in general, if you look at the data that's out there, there's a few studies. There's one by Nuzzo. There's a couple of studies by David Drake with rugby players in Ireland. And if you look at the averages for the group, the rate of force development and the peak force is higher. But if you look at the effects, if you look at the... Um, standard deviations in confidence intervals, there's overlap. And I haven't seen data presented which compares the individuals, which is one of the reasons I've started collecting a bit of data on this, because as I said, some people love one version compared to the other. And it's a bit like if you ask people about recovery strategy, what, what recovery strategy works best? Sure. Or whichever one you prefer. Because if you're forced to do an ice bath and you hate it, your cortisol level goes through the roof. <laughs> 
that's probably not helping their recovery at that point. Yeah. Um, so it's there is going to be some uh, individual variability. The key thing is, if you're using one of those, stick with it. Don't change it. Stick with the test. Standardize the joint angles because it's exactly the same with the ISO pull and ISO squat. The joint angles, the cues, everything else needs to be standardized so that you can monitor your athletes because most practitioners are using this for longitudinal monitoring and we can monitor them effectively if we standardize everything that we need to. The issue that we have sometimes, if you look at those thresholds that we mentioned earlier for the dynamic strength index, if you're going to use that, if you use an isometric mid-thigh pull, um, we've got those 0.8 or above, focus on strength, 0.6 or below, focus on ballistic and plyometric capabilities. Between 0.6 and 0.8, use a mixed methods approach. So an almost equal distribution of strength and ballistic and plyometric training. Because you generally, I'm saying generally, because we've already said that, you know, individuals do vary. You generally get a higher peak force with an ISO squat. What thresholds do we use? We haven't got those thresholds established. Right. And it's the same with, you know, we're looking at an isometric belt squat at the moment to avoid the axial loading. There's a whole load of issues with that. How comfortable is it? Um, if you just use a standard uh, sort of uh, dipping or chinning belt that you use when you're doing your dips and chins um, or something you get off a flywheel device and it's just a, just across the hips, you get some pretty severe chafing. Trust me, I've piloted out <laughs> a phone line. Um, when you go in the shower afterwards and it's not very pleasant. Um, so that causes a problem. If you use the full body harness and it goes over the shoulders as well, that distributes that compression over a range of areas. You don't get the chafing. You get much higher forces. Mm. Uh, but what is best? And how do you take up the slack within that system as well? So we don't know. You definitely get dramatically higher forces on an isometric belt squat compared to an isometric squat and an isometric mid-thigh pull. But then we probably need to reestablish those thresholds for training maximum force production or training the more ballistic capabilities. And we haven't got that information yet. Hopefully, I'll be realistic, give us two years and <laughs> hopefully we'll collect enough data um, at our university and with some people elsewhere that we collaborate with, whether that's in Europe, in America, in Australia. And we should be able to get some big data sets in to say, well, this is the difference it makes. So, you know, if we test everyone with a counter movement jump with an isometric mid five pull, an isometric squat and an isometric bout squat using what whatever we define as being the best protocols, then we can see if those thresholds need to change if we use an alternative isometric uh, multi-joint force test. At the moment, we just we haven't got that information. Um, and I've seen some data where you get in 70, 80 newtons per kilogram on an isometric belt squat. And you're getting, if you're lucky, 35 newtons per kilogram during the jump. Wow. And I'm looking at that going, well, that tells me that they need to improve their ballistic capability. But you've got a basketball player with a 70 centimeter vertical jump <laughs> and they're seven foot tall. I don't think they need to improve their ballistic capability. Right. So this doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's an extreme. I'm sure if I did it with rugby players or soccer players in the UK, it'd be totally different. Um, but yeah, th there's lots of questions still to be answered on some tests, which we consider quite basic. Yeah. But ultimately for the coach, whatever protocol you're using at the moment, don't let me change what you're doing. Stick with it for longitudinal monitoring. If you are sat there going, hang on a moment, I'm performing the isometric mid-thigh pull, but the bar's almost by my knee, yeah, change it next season and tell the athletes you're going to scrap the old data and you're going to start start afresh because you're doing an isometric Romanian deadlift. Yeah. The reason, the reason I say that is if you look at some of the older literature, I think there's a paper by uh, Professor Kijo Hakkinen where they refer to the first pull, the second pull, and the third pull. So the second pull is a transitional the scoop, double knee bend, whatever term you want to use for it. Right. The third pull is what we refer to normally as a second, second pull. pull. Yeah. So I think that's why some people have gone down near the knee for the second pull posture. That's that's not the power position. That's not what we're after. <laughs> wow. Okay. So I'm going to actually change this question a little bit because originally I was going to ask about, you know, if you're in an applied setting 
what wiggle room do you have with your assessment process? But I think I want to flip that a little bit. And instead, what I want to ask you is, obviously, you're in a research setting and there's a certain standard you have to be held to to get reliable and consistent data. Taking that to an applied setting, whether you're in a gym or you're working with a team, you maybe don't want, you don't need that level of consistency, but you want to keep things at a high level. What would you describe as your non-negotiables, right? When you're testing or you're evaluating, it could be an IMTP, a jump test. What are some things you're like, hey man, that's just not going to cut it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Uh, to be honest, I don't think it changes much from being in that applied uh, applied setting to the research setting. So even in even in the research setting, your subjects don't want to be in the lab for too long. Yep. Unless you're paying them by the hour, and they'll <laughs> sit around for, for ages and get some more money, but they, they don't want to be around for too long. So the isometric mid thigh pull key things: posture has to be spot on, no counter movement, no cheating, so no dipping down before you actually start that propulsive force or the isometric force production, and you have to make sure they've got lifting straps. Now, we always get them on the force plates and record data. We just delete it afterwards, well, after the trial, and show them the force time curve. Show them what it looks like. Explain how it should be. If there is a counter movement, explain what the problem is. If they're in max dorsiflexion, that helps some of the time to eliminate um, some of the, that counter movement you might see in a, an initial deflection. Um, so I think that the key thing is then make sure that those things are all correct. And if you have to do one or two trials extra, make it clear to the athlete, if you do a poor trial, you're going again. <laughs> if you keep getting better though, if your first one wasn't a true max effort and you jump up by you know 10%, or the threshold normally for the isometric mid thigh pull is 250 newtons, we normally go with 10% a lot now, to be honest with you, because 250 newtons for one person can be quite a lot for somebody else. It can be, you know, if you've got 50 newtons per kilogram, 250 newtons is, is hardly anything. Right. Um, so if we see a continual rise, we'll discard the earlier trials and we'll do a couple of extras. As soon as you tell the athletes that, they tend to put in a maximum effort straight away because they want to do as little extra work as possible, yes. which makes sense. Um, make sure it's a competitive environment. That, yeah. that definitely, definitely helps. Uh, if it's something like jump testing, it's the standardization of things like they aren't using arm swing. We're looking at lower body, body force production capability. Hands are on the hips. Yep. Um, they have to stand still and they have to stand upright, stand tall. Because when we assess their, their jump height, if their center of mass is lower at the start because they're already in a semi-squatting position, that will inflate their jump height when we calculate jump height afterwards. So they have to stand upright. And you just have to, you have to treat them like like a normal individual. And if you need to tell them off, you tell them off. <laughs> um, like we, we try and get some of our undergraduate and postgraduate students to come out and assist us with the testing. But we'll put them through some rigorous training beforehand. The only thing you can put them through is when they turn up and there's a Premier League football player or you know a star rugby league or rugby union player that they idolise that's there. And they're messing about, they're playing on the phone or whatever else. You have to, it's like, no, stop. I need five minutes of your time. That's it. We're done. You can go and play on whatever social media app you're using afterwards. Right. Well, that goes to one side. Uh, and as soon as you do that, they're completely fine. Um, but it is a case of making sure that everything is standardized as much as possible. And if something goes wrong, stop. You explain why it went wrong. Be completely honest with them and go again. And, you know, that's... It's relatively quick and easy to do that. And as soon as they make one mistake on one trial, they generally don't make that same mistake again. Because as I said, they don't want to be there doing extra work. Right. Um, so it's not it's not normally a, a, a big deal for that. Um, and it's just explaining the difference that's going to make. Well, and sometimes it's even a case of, look, I know that wasn't a good effort. I can <laughs> perform better. I can get on there now without a warm-up and still outperform you. Put some effort in. Right. And you've just got to be honest with them. And when you are, they tend to go, okay, yeah, I didn't really put in an effort. I'll go again. Right. One of the most impactful things, I think, at least with the Hawkins software, is the force trace. Being able to show them in real time, like, hey, look, I need you to stand still. Because in very pretty much every test, that's important. But also yeah. being able to show them, hey, look, when I say you can't counter movement, 
and you zoom in on it and you're like, this is what you're doing before you go. The ability to show them and give them that feedback in real time, I feel is incredibly valuable. Yeah, that makes a huge difference. And the nice thing is specifically for the Hawking Dynamics software is they have to stand still for a second and then the app will beep and flash to say go. Yep. So you'd, we used to do it with the Kisslers. So you'd, you'd hit, I'd hit start data collection. I'd hit the enter button on the keyboard. Yep. And then I'd go three, two, I'll stop, you just moved. <laughs> and then you do it again. Three, two, one, jump, push, pull, whatever the cue is. Right. That was fine. Whereas with this, it's right, you have to stand completely still. Once you're stood still, and sometimes you get after he's going, why is it not beeped? Well, are you stood still? <laughs> are you leaning on the bar on an ISO pull? Are you already pulling on the bar? Cancel that trial, talk them through it again, right, go again. And again, if their teammates are around and they've done well, and this person can't stand still for one second, <laughs> it doesn't take long for their teammates to give them some uh, some encouragement and yes. they get it right. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. Okay, so kind of last but not least here, even though force plates are quite a bit cheaper than they were in the past, I still don't know if I'd describe them as cheap per se. So one thing I'm interested in is, you know, are there alternatives out there to force plates for somebody who's maybe not ready to jump full force into, you know, buying a pair or leasing a pair, whatever the case may be? What kind of alternatives or options would you use if you were like starting with a shoestring budget? Well, I think with things like an isometric mid-thigh pull, you can use a strain gauge. Uh, most strain gauges sample at a low frequency. So then you would have to just go with peak force. You've probably not got a high enough frequency for rapid force production. Although there are a few more um, products coming on the market now where they are sampling at 500 to 1,000 hertz, which would be okay for rapid force production. But the counter movement jumps, rebound jumps, those sorts of things, that's difficult. Yeah, because you only get jump height, and you can cheat the system. Yep. You know, you we've all you seen that, touch right? Up, touch slightly on landing, yeah, that that's going to give you problems. So, for fundamental testing and longitudinal monitoring of athletes, some form of optoelectric system, contact map, opto jump, those sorts of things, they're going to be okay. But actually. Most of those still aren't cheap. You're still yeah, talking in the UK. You're still talking a thousand pounds plus for those. I would personally say, well, I'll do. I'll get a bit of chalk, which costs me hardly anything. I'll pay that out of my own pocket, <laughs> and I can do a sergeant jump. I can do a jump in reach onto the wall, and I'll do that for the next two years. And I'll pull my budgets together over a couple of years, and then I'll get some force plates. Yeah. If it is a, a jump type test, uh, because otherwise it's it's so difficult to know whether the athlete has change their jump strategy if they've said, done something different it's for longitudinal monitoring it's not so bad if you're trying to use it for daily monitoring if you haven't got a force plate don't bother we know jump jump height is not sensitive enough right um to fatigue if your jump height decreases decreases dramatically you're in a big hole <laughs> yep um so what we need to be able to do is identify their strategy. Did they change their counter movement displacement? Did the time, when whether that's the time to take off uh, or contraction time or whatever term people want to use for it, movement time, all the individual phases, the unweighting, the breaking, the propulsion phase, <clears throat> if those times have changed, if they've increased to get the same jump height, your athlete's probably fatigued. Yep. If they've decreased and jump height has stayed the same, fantastic, you've improved. Because now it's taking you less time to achieve the same impulse and therefore the same jump height. So, yeah, I think if if you've got jump mats and those sorts of things available and you can't afford force plates, keep using them. If you're looking to buy something, maybe see if you can increase your budget. Are there other options for you finding some extra funding to do it? Can you pull it from another budget? And go with the force plates if you can, because they do give you so much more information. Um, especially about those individual phases of the jump, the depth they've gone to. And as you just described yourself, you know, the feedback from saying, well, here's the false trace. This is what you've just done. This isn't correct. Right. How'd you do that on the jump map? Yeah, you, you can. can't. You've you got can. no way of doing it. Well, I think one of the things that's been really interesting for me is some of the discussions I've already had. It, for example, I've got one particular parent. I've trained his son for about a year now, and the dad swears that, the child needs to be more explosive, right? Now, keep in mind, 
this guy can already dunk a basketball. He's touching like 11 foot one. So I would say, oh, he looks pretty explosive. But now that I've got all this extra data, right, and I can see uh, his time to take off, like you alluded to, or his counter movement depth and how low he's got to get down to produce this force, it's like, oh, okay, well, now this is a different way of looking at this. Maybe he's talking more about that quickness and his explosiveness, right? Being able to touch that same height in a shorter period of time yep. or was yep. less, less depth. So I think that's what's really exciting for me is being able to continue to look at and analyze how people, like you very eloquently stated, their strategy and find ways to optimize their strategy so they can maximize their performance. Yeah, because you do get some extremes. We we tested pre-season um, for um, soccer in the UK. We tested about 600 athletes. And we had five or six anomalies. Two to one percent were anomalies. Yeah. Uh, we had, as as the extreme at the other end, we had a rugby league player who was jumping fifty six centimeters, which by NBA standards isn't very good, but for a rugby league player weighing one hundred and ten kilos, that's, um, that's pretty, pretty impressive. Good. Yeah, we had a one point two second time to take off. He was winding that right up. <laughs> 1,200 milliseconds. You know, that was yeah. a big sport. Though. Yeah. So for him, it was a case, right, your jump height is fantastic. That's great. But we need you to be more explosive, more reactive. You can't take that long because yeah. your opponent is already up in the air and caught the ball. Yeah. So you cannot do that. We had the reverse with some of the soccer players. We had a few of them where we looked and went, hang on a moment. They must have done something strange here. So normally you're looking at between about 500 and 700 milliseconds for a counter movement jump. We had a couple of people down at the 380, 400 milliseconds and still having a really, really good jump height. Hmm. And we're looking at this, this is good. This, hmm. this is really impressive. Right. So, you know, are they are they strong? Are they able to use this reactive capability really well? Are they just really elastic? When we looked at their strength levels, you know, they, they weren't strong at all. But they were unweighting really, really rapidly, hmm. hitting the brakes. And the only thing we can assume, and it is an assumption, the force time data just tells us, you know, are they accelerating, decelerating? It doesn't tell us concentric, eccentric, muscle actions, etc. And um, we just make those assumptions based on the direction the person's moving. Right. Um, but really, really short movement times, very, very short unweighting, very short braking. So they must have just slammed the brakes on really, really hard, almost fully unweighting like they've come off the floor. And then it gives them a longer duration for propulsion. So they might have still had the, the same propulsion phase duration as somebody that took 700 milliseconds, but they could just unweight and hit the brakes really, really hard. Hmm. In that situation, that's definitely not eccentric. That's passive lengthening of the muscles go isometric for a very short period of time. Right. And then you've got the propulsive phase, which is going to be concentric. But as I said, they're anomalies that you're looking at 1% of those athletes. Hmm. But for them, they were weak as well. So it's like, okay, well, their reactive capabilities, their explosiveness is fantastic. Now we just need to get them stronger. So then they've got more force to use. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, my friend, big question time. If you could alter the space-time continuum and give young Paul Comfort one piece of advice, what would it be? I suppose two things. It would be believe in yourself and read more. Mm, okay. You always think you're reading enough. You never read uh, enough. And, and you always doubt yourself. Yeah. Sometimes you sit there and you look at something and think, no, that can't be right. This eminent professor is, and people do it in my work. Yeah. I'm pretty sure people will go, oh, well, that must be right because he's done it. No, some of it's not. <laughs> <laughs> because, at the, you know, I can look back to stuff I published 10 years ago where I think, oh, I could have done that better. Yeah. But that's because I didn't know 10 years ago what I know now. Right. So that comes back to the read more, learn more, spend the time learning, um, ask more questions. Most people, most people in our industry are happy to help yes. and happy to reach out. And I'm not going to name any names, but I've, I've met a few people in over the past probably 15 years where I thought, oh, they you know, they love themselves a bit. <laughs> They're not going to be helpful. They're a bit arrogant. Actually, They've got strong opinions, and they've got strong opinions normally for very good reasons. Normally, they're right. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. They've been doing this for a long time, so they're right. Um, and you can have a difference of opinion with them. Sit down and have a discussion, and nine times out of ten, you come back going, "No, there isn't a difference of opinion. I've written something this way; they've written something another way. We actually mean the same thing." Mm. Or 
you know, I've heard them say something in a conference. I took it out of context when we sit down and discuss it. So read more and discuss with other practitioners, with researchers, both ideally. You know, you really need practitioners and researchers to work together. Yes. No good me coming up with what I think is a good research question. If a practitioner is going to go, I don't care about that. (laughs) Right. But then they probably don't know how to apply that sort of research methodology to answer their own questions. Yep. Uh, So, yeah, you know, read a lot more, but believe in yourself. Sometimes you'll look at stuff and go, oh, I can't be right here. That must be wrong. Not always. Other people could be wrong. Sometimes there's the really simple stuff that everyone overlooks. Yep. I love it. Okay. Last but not least, lightning round. So four fairly short questions. Your answer can be as long or short as you like. Number one, this may be like choosing a favorite child, but do you have a favorite piece of literature you've published to date? Yeah, I do actually. Um, let me think of the title. Effects of Space Flight on Musculoskeletal Health. Oh, yeah. Um, which is a systematic review and meta- meta-analysis, and it's basically considerations for interplanetary travel. If we're going to go to Mars, can we do it? No, people will die on the way back. Hmm. Pretty simple. The amount of time it takes to get to Mars and back, unless we improve the exercise countermeasures, people will die before they get back to Earth. Oh, wow. Okay. Because of the amount of muscle wastage. However, if those astronauts adhere to the exercise regimes that they're told to do, and if we slightly up the level of um, physical capability before they get onto, you know, uh, Elon Musk's uh, starship to go to Mars, they'll be okay. That's but cool. We've got to get some of that stuff right. And I, I, I'd said for a couple of years, I really wanted to look at it. And at one point, I, I found that I had a little bit more time. Well, I created more time for myself. I just said, I'm not doing some of the other rubbish. This is what I'm going to focus on. Right. And it was so interesting reading through those areas and just applying the stuff that we do as strength coaches, physical performance coaches, however we want to brand ourselves, applying that basic science to space flight and then looking and going well, why don't people do this the yeah. recommendations are okay why don't the astronauts do it and you know what are the issues and yeah that that it was fun yeah uh, it was fun to do it took a long time i'm <laughs> sure <laughs> that sounds cool okay number two i'm interested to hear this one what's your biggest pet peeve in the research space you could start me off on a real run here. <laughs> <laughs> Short or long as you like, man. <laughs> Got an hour? <laughs> yeah. um, I th- no, I suppose there's, at the moment, it's probably the publish or perish culture that you get within research, within universities. Mm. You keep publishing, publish more. No, publish quality. Yeah. What, I'll agree. Start my career. It's like, I need to get some publications out there. I need to pe- get people to know my name. Um, and I need to tackle some of this stuff, but not at the expense of quality. Yep. And it has to be good quality. You need to make sure you've read all of the literature in that area. And there's some obscure literature. And I can give you a perfect example. I published a paper where I invited uh, Professor Mike Stone to be a co-author on it. So I thought he's, he's done stuff in this area. I need his expertise. Either I'm going to ask for him to be a reviewer for the publication or I need to get him as a co-author. And he came back to me and very nice feedback. Most of it, <laughs> a couple of it. Uh, were, Why? Yeah. Um, that doesn't make sense. But there was one bit where it said, I agree with you here. However, you need to go away and read these three papers. And there were papers from the 1960s. So you can't go on PubMed or any search engine and find these papers. So I searched them out. I found them. Then I looked through their reference lists. So he told me to read three. It ended up that I read 46 additional papers. Oh, wow. Not just the three suggested. Because I thought I've got to be thorough now. Because if I'm not thorough, he's going to go, well, what about these? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. I've been told off by your father. So I'm thinking, (laughs) I've got to get this right. 46 additional papers. I added one sentence to that manuscript. Hmm. That was it. Um, but I learned a hell of a lot. It didn't add a lot to the manuscript, but I learned a lot. Yeah, That delayed the manuscript by probably four or five months. But 
it had to be right when it went out there. Because if I publish something now, and as I've said, I can look back at some of my stuff from 10 years ago and go, oh, why did I do it that way? Why didn't I do X, Y, or Z? It needs to be the best that it can be at that point in time. Don't obsess over something you did 10, 15 years ago when you didn't know any better or you didn't have the technology back then. Yeah. Um, but I think that's also made worse sometimes by some of the um, pay to publish journals. They'll accept any rubbish. Some right. of them will. Right. And there's some stuff that gets published that I look at and go, oh, no. Or I may have reviewed yeah. for two or three other journals and it's reject, reject, reject. The authors don't change anything throughout. And um, because they're then paying a few thousand dollars or euros or whatever to get it published, it gets published. Hmm. that's that's a real problem yeah that's but the good. problem is those journals publish some really good stuff too oh that makes sense so how, doesn't it yeah how do you identify what's good and bad and that means we need to make sure that we educate people researchers practitioners so they can understand and interpret the research better yeah um now that in itself is a challenge but yeah i think the people feeling compelled to publish more and you do have to publish more but you don't have to do 10 15 20 publications in a year you know a few really high quality ones would be much better than double the number that have got some flaws within them absolutely okay so this third one may not be a true lightning round question but i know you and your team are digging into the idea of microdosing and strength training and i've heard this utilized a lot in the speed world but maybe like a brief synopsis. What are you finding there? What are you excited about in that realm? I think the most exciting thing is, is we've just scratched the surface. Yeah. So um, luckily, one of my PhD students who just passed his PhD now, um, everything signed off, Dr. Matt Cuthbert, uh, he had his PhD funded by the Football Association in the UK. They wanted to look at some training solutions for when they go on camps and then when they have tournaments, and you've got an extended period of competition, you want to still try and hit them with a, some form of strength stimulus. Yep. You might have 15, 20 minutes in a day. But you might have that most days apart from the day of competition. So what do we do? Mm. So there was a paper out by Killen at that point looking at micro training in um, military recruits, showing that it could be more effective. So rather than doing two big prolonged banks throughout a week, subdividing it down into multiple banks, you do a similar total volume but split over over multiple sessions. And then Derek Hansen had uh, done some stuff in a couple of blogs talking about it, as, as yeah. you said, with uh, speed sort of training, sprint training, and it appeared really effective. But going back way be beyond that, you know, you look at it in psychotropic drugs, mm. in, yeah. in, you know, for medical purposes. Sure. And some of these drugs, are, you know, way below what would be considered a therapeutic dose or or normally most of them is a recreational dose yeah <laughs> so it doesn't have a perceived effect you don't perceive that you're struggling uh that, that has having any effect on you but it's such a small amount but frequently that accumulates and gives you a, a real benefit to your health mm. so that's really where it came from so we we started looking at this and you know another analogy for it is if you know christmas day you decide, you know what, I'm going to have, I'm going to have seven pints or I'm going to have seven glasses of wine. Go with seven glasses of wine because it's more potent. Seven glasses yeah. of wine. The next day, you're going to have hangover. Yeah. Unless you drink a lot already. Yeah. It's a bit like if you do all of your training volume in one day. The next day, you're going to be sore. You're going to be struggling. If we split that up and say, I'll have a glass of wine every evening with, with my evening meal, you're not going to hang over. You're going to be fine. Completely yeah. fine. So it's that same sort of principle. You don't perceive there's going to be any effect from it, but actually accumulated over time, that resistance training, the volume that you accumulate in a week will be beneficial. Now, we've seen a couple of different things. And as I've said, we've only really scratched the surface, but we've seen that compliance rates are higher Yep. if we microdose. Because if we're doing two sessions per week, you miss one session because you were ill, you had a niggle, you had you know, media or press duties, you've missed 50% of your training volume. Yeah. That's not good. You do that a couple of weeks in a row, that's a negative effect. Sure. <clears throat> if you do four sessions in a week and you miss one, you've only missed 25% of your training volume. 
And also, you're not sore the next day. Yeah. The potential negative is sometimes athletes, depending on the sport, if you look at uh, rugby in the UK, they want to feel like they've done a workout. They want to leave with a pump. You know, they want that extra inch on their biceps or their quads. <laughs> or their, you know. Yeah. And, yeah, I get that. I get that. But it's education. Whereas in, in football, in soccer, it seems to be that they quite enjoy it. Because they're not leaving feeling fatigued. They go out, yeah. they can go out on the pitch afterwards and do a good training session. Or they can come off the pitch knowing they've only got a small volume. And even though they feel a bit fatigued, they can go at it for 20 minutes. Yeah. Well, that seems to be the benefit, one of the really beneficial advantages. Um there's a huge amount more to do. We've got so much more data um from Matt's uh, PhD looking at the potential benefits for priming. So, you know, you do the high load activity the day before competition or even you do a high load activity in the morning. Does it potentiate what you do in your training session in the afternoon, et cetera? How much does it really cause uh, a change in neuromuscular function if you're doing it more frequently compared to twice a week, but you hit them hard? So we've got all this data we still need to go and analyze. So we took the opportunity to collect as much as we could and then got to the point where we said, right, you've got to submit your thesis. This other stuff we can do afterwards. Right. Um, so yeah, lots lots of real benefits. The biggest issue with it is people really confuse microdosing with a minimum effective dose. And there are periods of time, congested periods of competition when you would go minimum effective dose. Let's just maintain. Yeah. You don't do that for a whole season. Right. You know, if you imagine somebody came to you as a head of performance, says, yeah, okay, I've got whatever it is, a 40-week 40, 40 season, I'm going to maintain my athlete's performance. You're not getting employed. No. You know, no one's going to employ somebody. No. Says, but that's no. the approach that's taken sometimes. Yep. Um, so there are periods of time when you may use minimal effective dose. There are periods of time where you can ramp it up. The other thing we haven't looked at, which could be really beneficial, we train more frequently. We don't have to just do, you know, if you go from two sessions per week to four, we don't just have to do half the volume. That equates volume. We can be really sneaky. We can go, let's go 60 or 70% of the volume in each session. So now our volume's higher. So if I want a hypertrophic response, they're not sore. They're not perceiving any fatigue, but I've given them a greater volume. They get greater hypertrophy. Right. That's cool. So we, we can be a little bit sneaky with that. Um, so that, the, yeah, the, it's the more we've looked into it, uh, uh, Matt's actually just submitted a, uh, a review article really looking at sort of the conceptual framework behind it and the theoretical framework. And it's huge. The more we looked into it and the more we said, yeah, there, there's so much more to do here. Uh, and it grew and it grew and it grew. So we're hoping that will get accepted for publication and create a little bit of um, interest in the area. No, that's fascinating. Okay, last but not least, number four, what's next for Paul Comfort? What are you working on? What are you excited about? Anything? Uh I'm really excited about having a rest over Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> I bet. I bet. <laughs> uh, no, there, there, there's a there's a huge number of things. Um, there's some of the stuff to do with microdosing where we've still got to write up some of the research. I've got a project funded by the National Strength and Conditioning Association, which has been delayed for two years because of COVID with travel restrictions. They were hoping to get out to the USA and actually do some um conduct a training intervention there. A few things have fallen through because as you can imagine in that two years of delay, coaches and staff have moved on. Yep. Um, so we had all agreement and everything ready to go. Then we went into lockdown and then it didn't happen. Now they've moved, so that's caused issues. We've got a lot of projects we're doing aligned to some of the stuff we discussed, you know, comparing isometric squat, isometric, uh, isometric mid-thigh pull, isom isometric belt squat. How does that change all those different thresholds? And also looking at some of the more, I suppose, clinical testing methods, single joint isometric hamstring testing, plantar flexion tests. Mm. There's a couple of studies out there at the moment. They are flawed is probably the best way of phrasing it. Okay. You know, if you're using an Airx pad or a foam pad when you're then doing a, a seated knee flexed plantar flexion test, well, you change joint angle dramatically, and the more force you apply, the more that pad will compress, right. and the more your joint angle will change. That's really not a good scientific and robust method of doing it. We need <laughs> something firm. Yep. A bar isn't any good because it hurts like hell. Right. But we need something better than a pad that will compress. 
Um, so we're looking into some options for those sorts of things. The belt squat, as I said earlier, it can create some real, real chafing. Um, we've got to find an alternative to that, but that has some real potential there. Um, and then just looking at a range of other different methods that we can use for optimizing not just maximum, but also rapid force production. So, that, yeah, there's there's a hell of a lot of, st- a lot of stuff that we're, we're trying to do in trying to look at it in athletic populations, but with some of it also looking in, you know, other populations, whether it's tactical with, you know, first responders, military, um, normal, the normal population. Yep. As people age, we've got a progressively aging population. Yep. They need to stay straight. Everyone emphasizes aerobic training. They need to strength train. So it's looking at some of those topics as well, um, which actually means there's a hell of a lot more jobs for strength coaches um, than we actually perceive there really are. Yeah. Because they could be working with all populations from children through to elderly to different occupations, et cetera. And that's, that's where these things need to go because it's great improving someone's performance. If we could improve people's lives as well, that would be even better. It's pretty powerful, right? Yeah, definitely. I love it. Dude, I'm going to be following everything you put out because I am a big fan. Uh, I feel a little bit fanboyish. Again, I got the got the article here. <laughs> Unfortunately, all the other articles that came from that article. But man, really appreciate your time. I know it's late there. If people want to follow you, learn more about your work, where can they go to find out about you? Uh, probably most active on Twitter, uh, Paul Comfort 1975 um, so you can work out my age from that. Um, <laughs> I think I think it might even be the same on Instagram, but I tend not to use the Instagram as frequently. If they want to contact me, uh, it's p.comfort at sulfur.ac.uk. Okay. Um, so they can con- contact me via email. I'll get back to them as soon as possible. Not over the Christmas period because my wife will kill me. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, get, get in contact. As I said earlier, you know, I think a lot of people in the strength and conditioning profession are happy and willing to help people. Even if it's just, let's have a chat about something. Yep. Um, almost like we've done this evening. You know, yeah. you want to record it, record it. If, if you don't, and it's, <laughs> for, it's for you personally, fine. Um, because it, I think the more we can discuss these things and try and improve practices that go on, the better it is for everyone. Agreed. Well, Paul, again, thank you so much for your time, man. I really appreciate it. No problem at all, Mike. It's been a pleasure. All right, my friend, that does it for this week's episode of the Physical Prep Podcast with Dr. Paul Comfort. Really hope you enjoyed it. I felt like it was an awesome episode, so many great insights, and and Dr. Comfort is just a wealth of knowledge. If you go to his ResearchGate page, we're talking hundreds of published and peer-reviewed articles, and he's somebody that I think I'm not just going to learn from in the short term, but for a very long period of time. And You know, look, if you're using force plates, that's awesome. Hopefully this show helps you out a little bit. If not, hopefully this show at least gives you some insights as to what they're doing at the highest levels and how you can upskill whatever it is you're doing. Because look, we're all at a different point in the game. We all have different means and resources available to us. So use whatever you have and try and make the best of it because it's not about us, right? It's not about us. It's about giving our clients and our athletes the best possible results. So uh, thank you to Dr. Paul for coming on. Thank you to Hawk and Dynamics for sponsoring the show. Appreciate you guys. And if you enjoyed this episode, I have one small favor to ask. If you enjoyed it, please go right now and subscribe wherever you consume podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, Spotify, the Amazon store, wherever you consume podcasts, hit the subscribe button right now. So you know each and every week when a new episode drops. So my friend, as always, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back next week with our next episode. Take care.